fight for your marriage. Work hard in your relationship. This is what the writer of Proverbs has encouraged us to do. Be intoxicatingly in love with your spouse so your eyes are just locked in on her or him. When you get to the book of Proverbs, there is a lot of talk and there is a lot that is written about the issue of sexual purity. And, but because of the uncomfortable nature of it, often we don't talk about it a lot. But it is, it is covered extensively in the book of Proverbs And so I want to kind of uh, dive into that a little bit this evening. So 5, 6, and 7 of Proverbs deal primarily with this issue of it's, it's it's a dad warning his son against the danger of sexual sin, okay? Now, when you read the book of Proverbs, one of the things you need to understand is this, that it is primarily a book uh, from a man to his son, and that's how it was used by the early Jews in the sense that it was, it was basically a manual for the Boy Scouts, if, if I can use that term. So don't think that there's some discrimination here or this doesn't apply to women. Just because in the, it's, it, he, he is dealing primarily with boys, you have to understand that that's kind of who it was written to. And then obviously get to the end of the book and it deals with the virtuous woman and the virtuous wife. And, but, but it's primarily written from a father to his son. So it, the application is the same. It doesn't mean if you're a female in the room that you check out and say, well, it's, it's talking to the men. I'm not talking to the men. I'm talking to, to all of us in general and in regard to, say, to uh, keeping ourselves sexually pure. Now, we live in a very promiscuous world, and we live in a world where I'm not even sure where we're at sexually anymore. It's just about... Um, as depraved as it's been in a long time. And I think that one of the ways that we can kind of stand out is to keep ourselves uh, sexually pure and to keep ourselves as the Bible calls us to be. So how can we do that? Well, uh, he gives us a lot of instruction here in regard to how we can stay clean in a dirty world, how we can stay sexually pure in a promiscuous world. So let me just read a few of the verses and then we'll kind of jump back in uh, to the text or the outline, and and I'll give you some things to write down. Notice what he says in verse number one of Proverbs 5. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, you do not know them. Therefore hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor to others, and your years to the cruel one. Lest aliens be filled with your wealth, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And you mourn at last, when your flesh and your body are consumed, and say how I hated instruction, and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. So, one of the first things that I think the implication is here is how we can stay pure in a sexual, in a promiscuous world, is to one, we must redefine beauty. We must redefine beauty. So when I say the word beauty, or I use the word beautiful in describing a person, I would say that 99% of you in the room, immediately your thoughts go to the external. Like, um, when what's the magazine that used to do the, the sexiest man alive? I don't know. The, the, is it people? Okay, thank you. <laughs> we know everybody in the room that's a people subscriber now. Anyway, but... Um, no, it's just people. Okay, remember they had the sexiest man alive or the most beautiful. So, but what is all that focus? It's all on the external. It's on how do they look on the outside, you know, their, their shape, their genetics. But when you read the Bible, you see that God defines beauty a totally different way. What does the Bible say? That man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. That's, that's where he looks. He looks 
at the heart. And, and we see so many examples of that in, in Scripture. We see it, for example, when God chose a man that was going to be the next king of Israel after Saul. Remember, he went to uh, the house of Jesse, and he was going to pick out one of his boys. And remember, David was such an unlikely candidate that his father didn't even bring him out. We know that he became a, a man who was attractive. We know that he became a man that was, that was uh, maybe what we would consider to be beautiful. But in the, sense, in the time, he was just a young lad. He was just seen as insignificant. He was seen, no, there's no way this is the next guy. He was not seen as beautiful. But what, did, what do we learn about David? He was a man after God's own heart. So we see that the world, in particular his own father, looked at the external where God looked at the heart, and David was the one that was chosen because of his heart for God. Uh, when you think about who God chose to bring his son into the world in, it was, remember, to be a virgin, and, and as it was prophesied in the Old Testament. And Mary was not chosen because of her external beauty. She was not chosen because she was from a particular family or had certain genetics. In fact, Jesus grew up in such a rough city or in such a difficult city that people said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? But Mary was just this simple woman who loved God. And that was the beauty. And, and I think that it's easy for us, as even as believers, even as followers of God, that Jesus did not look at people in regard to their external features. Jesus always looked at people for their character, their love for God, their love for others. This is how he, he looked at people. He, he redefined what made a person beautiful. And we live in this culture, man, where you got to look a certain way and, and uh, you know, you have to, you have, your body has to look a certain way and you, you have to go to all these great lengths to make yourself look attractive or look beautiful to the world. And I think that we would we could we could be we would stay sexually pure if we would redefine what really makes a person beautiful. And it's not the external. And yet that's what gets a lot of people tripped up is the external. And that's what he that's what the the writer of Proverbs is talking about here. He's talking about that this this woman is pulling her in here her 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 lip the lips of an immoral woman drip and and she is just she's She's externally beautiful, but if you develop a relationship with her, it's going to end in destruction. In fact, it says that this road is the path to hell. So we've got to, if we want to uh, stay clean, we must redefine what makes a person beautiful. We, it, it's, people are not just sexual objects. There is much more to them than that. And so many people, for example, when picking a mate, it's, it's physical one, you know, emotional two, spiritual three. And I think that's a huge mistake. So we must redefine what makes a person beautiful. Let me tell you something. If you marry somebody that's a knockout, drop-dead gorgeous individual, but they're a jerk, you will hate your life. And I know it, not from personal experience, but from people that I have spoken to, meaning that there's been people that have been like, you know, look, I married for the wrong reasons, and it was a disaster. So they, they, they got into a relationship, and it was all based on the external, and they had no love for God, and they had no character, and they had no uh, emotional stability, and it was a mess. So... Just, just we must look at people as God looks at people. We must redefine what makes a person beautiful. We must redefine how we look at individuals. And I, I don't know, you know, what I don't know what issues you may have with certain things. For example, you know, now being a uh, being a father of a daughter and being a uh, now having being a grandpa, okay, and you have so many uh, the 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 highest use of the internet is for pornography. 
But if I allow myself to go there, I am in a sense looking at people that is somebody's daughter and somebody's granddaughter. And I, I, am, I am looking at just the external and not who they are. They're not objects of meat. They're individuals with an eternal soul that's going somewhere, and we must redefine how we look at them if we're going to stay sexually pure. We must learn to see people through the eyes of Christ and redefine what beauty is. The second thing that he says if we're going to stay sexually pure, is we must count the cost. We must count the cost. And he talks about this specifically in chapter number 6. He says in 6, so he starts off in verse 6, 1 through 19, has nothing to do with immorality, but then he gets into verse number 20, and then he says, he's begging, we're going to talk about this more in a minute, but he's begging this kid to listen to his dad. And then he says... In, uh, in the reason why you need to listen to your dad, verse 24, to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of the seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is, is reduced to a crust of bread, and adulteress will prey upon his precious lives. And then he says in, uh, uh, well, he says that in verses 25 and 26. So that gives us the first thing. If you go down the path of sexual immorality, one, it will cost you wealth. And that's when he makes the reference here when he says, um, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. I remember years ago, and years, and when I talk years ago, I'm talking 30 plus years ago. And I was a young teenager, and I um, and I was talking to a, a man in our church who uh, had made some poor decisions. And he was telling me about, you know, he was working two and three jobs, and I'm like, you know, and so I asked him, why are you working so much? And he goes, because I have to pay child support. And I made a decision to cheat on my wife. My wife left me, took the kids with her. Now I pay child support. I can barely get by. This man was just living check to check, week to week. And, and he was like, it was a bad choice. And that's what the, song, that's what the writer of Proverbs is saying. If, if you make poor choices sexually, it will cost you wealth. Verses 27 through 31 give us the next one. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? This is, this is very applicable in our house right now, right, Karen? Because my wife cooked some seeds yesterday on a skillet, and she just had a she just forgot that when even if the skillet is on there and you grab the skillet's handle, it's the skillet is as hot as the skillet. The skillet handle is as hot as the skillet. So she grabbed the handle and burned her fingers, and she so she walked around all day with an aloe vera plant on her fingers and wrapped up in her trying to. Um, so she got a reaction, <laughs> and it was uh, it was hot. But it, it, it burned her. And that's, that's really the implication here is, look, man, you know, you'll, you'll hear that kind of that sexual, like it was hot, man. Well, okay, but you can't take something hot in you and not get burned. You, 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 can't, you can't take fire in your bosom and your clothes not be burned. You can't walk on whole coals and your feet not be seared. So is he who goes, on, goes into his neighbor's wife who touches her shall not be innocent. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. So the point is, is one, it will cost you wealth. The second thing he writes is it will cost you enjoyment. It's going to cost you enjoyment. Look, if, if you mess with somebody's wife, you're going to get that guy's, that wife, that woman's husband after you. Your enjoyment of life will plummet. 
right? Because now you have walked into territory. And that's what he talks about. He goes on to talk about, he says, people do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Look, it, you know, there's a thing going around Facebook where you got this bowl of there and these people come in and they, they took the whole bowl. You know, and everybody's indignant about they took the bowl. Okay, well, what if that family hadn't anything to eat in a while? It'd be all right if they took the bowl. You wouldn't be mad about that. But if you take something that's not yours, you, you, you stir up the hornet's nest, you're asking for a ton of trouble. And when you start meddling with people that are not yours to meddle with, it's gonna, you, your life's going to be miserable. Okay? You're not going to... Let me tell you what is uh, the greatest way to enjoy life, a clean conscience. And there's a lot of people who don't have clean consciences because they have, they have walked into stuff that they should never have walked into. They have messed with people they should have never have messed with. And when you just you treat people right and you do people right and you have a clean conscience, it just, it's, it, you, it's just... Now, I'm not sleeping good at night, not because I don't have a clean conscience, because I have issues. But, <laughs> but, but the point is, is that, man, you can just enjoy life more when you know you're right with people. But if you start messing with people's wives and husbands, you bring in a lot of trouble on yourself. And that's what he's trying to emphasize here. Okay, I know that you're tempted to do this, but do not do it because it leads to a bad place and it will cost you enjoyment. Number three, notice what he says in verse 32. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. So, number three, it will cost you common sense is, is one way that I could phrase it. It will cost you uh, common sense. It, it's just not very wise. And it just makes all other relationships difficult. Look, it's like sometimes with people. It's like, okay, so you're going to cheat on this individual. Who's to say they will not someday cheat on you? Right? So, okay, we're this, we're, I'm, I'm having this relationship with this person. They're not my wife. They're married. I'm married. But we're going to cheat on our spouses, and we're going to get together, and we're going to live happily ever after forever. Probably not. Because your marriage is built on mistrust. So, if, if she's willing to cheat on her husband and you're willing to cheat on your wife, what's the, what's the glue holding the next relationship together? Because I guarantee you, man, as hot as you think you are, they're hotter people. So if they dumped you, them for you, they will dump you for them. But see, we just lose our mind, man. We get in this fog, the fog of love. And it's not the fog of love, it's the fog of lust. And it just makes you, it's just you, you lack common sense. Hello? When your kids, you know, we're doing something stupid. Do you ever want to knock on their head and go, hello, anybody up there? But I, I don't do that. I don't recommend doing that. That's not, you shouldn't treat your kids that way. But, but man, sometimes, you know, when, when you talk to people and you're like, do you hear what you're saying? Verse 33. Wounds and dishonor, so this is what happens to a man who commits adultery with a woman. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. This is a big one. If you commit adultery, if you're not sexually pure, it will cost you your reputation. It will cost you your reputation. There's a lot of things that that I can't really, I have little control over, in the sense that, look, I'm not, uh, I may or may not be able to be wealthy, and I may or may not have certain gifts, but there's one thing that I got that doesn't cost any money that I, could, that I have all for my own, and that is my name, right? That's my name, and I can guard that name. I want to, 
Uh, what, did the, what did the writer of Proverbs say? A good name is better to be chosen than great riches. I want to be a man of integrity. I want to be a man of my word. I want to be a person of character. And what happens when you, when you are sexually loose, when, when you say to somebody, I love you forever, and then you cheat, you've lost your reputation. Your reputation has taken a huge hit. Because you just you become uh, not trustworthy. Because you can't keep your you say this and, and everybody's like, mm, I don't believe you. And this is why when when couples, when they uh, commit adultery, you destroy years and years and years of trust that has been built up. So it, everybody becomes skeptical and cynical, and it makes a relationship very difficult. And that's what he's saying. You lose your name. Fight for your name. So count the cost. It'll cost you your reputation. Then 34 and 35, for jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give him many gifts. What happens if you commit adultery number five? It will cost you peace. It will cost you peace. He goes, you'll never, you'll pay the guy off, you'll settle the score, you'll do whatever, and you're like, oh, man, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's going to make him happy or not. So how, how do I stay, how does Proverbs tell me to stay sexually pure? Well, I want to redefine beauty. I, want to, I don't want to look at people just based on the physical. I want to look at people based on their character, emotionally, spiritually, that's what some of the most beautiful people I've ever met weren't all that attractive on the outside. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be all three. You know, because it, it's kind of like people get mocked for that. Well, you know, they're beautiful on the inside. But man, it's, it's look at people not just externally. And, and you, can, you can look at somebody and go, that's an attractive person, but there doesn't need to be... But, what makes them attractive? What they are physically, but more so who they are internally. Then count the cost. Three, now I'm not even going here in 515, okay? Because 515 through 5 through 23 are exotic verses. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to just pass on these, okay? But let me just tell you, let me just read the first verse. Drink waters from your own cistern and running waters from your own well. So how do I how do I stay pure in a promiscuous world? Number three, magnify marriage. Magnify marriage. If I can sum up uh, how to have a strong marriage, I think there's two things that the Bible teaches when it comes to marriage. What the Bible is talking about here in 515, in particular through 519, is you are to be intoxicatingly in love with your spouse. Okay? You ever watch people that are newly married, you get on a plane with them, you know? And it's just like, get a room. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just they're they're just, you know, uh, okay, now. I understand that things change, but this should never really change. We should be intoxicatingly in love with one another because if you're crazy in love with your spouse, you won't be looking around. So this is the deal. Fight for your marriage. Work hard in your relationship. And then this is, what the, this is what the writer of Proverbs has encouraged us to do. Be intoxicatingly in love with your spouse so your eyes are just locked in on her or him. But man, when you're not, when you, when you and this is, this is why it's so important to forgive. Because what happens to us, man? We hurt each other. We're close. We hurt each other. And then when we hurt each other, we, we, we get bitter at one another and we, we get resentful, and we get hateful towards one another, and we start looking around. I need somebody who understands me. 
I need somebody who appreciates me. And, and we just, we lose the love for each other. But I, I passionately believe this, that love is two things. It is an action and it is a choice. You do not, you, you, you do not feel your way into love. You love your way into feeling. So I don't, I don't, see, see, we think love is just this warm, fuzzy feeling. No, the warm, fuzzy feeling will come if I will love my way into it, if I make the choice to love. So be intoxicatingly in love with your spouse. So choose to love them. And it'll keep you from looking around. Two, make your spouse your most intimate friend. So how can, when, when, how can I magnify marriage? Well, I'd be intoxicatingly in love with my wife, and I make her my most intimate friend. Make your mate your best friend. And don't make it a cliche. I hear people, oh, she, she's my best friend. Okay, you ain't talked to her in years. Don't just mean, mean it. What, what do best friends do? They hang out. They spend time together. They enjoy being with each other. Magnify marriage. Man, just get so in love that, you, that the thought of cheating doesn't even cross your mind. Because you're like, man, I got it as good as it is. But we don't... See, the problem with all of us is we want the cheap way. We want, we want to hit the reset button. Like, okay, man, this is not working out. And... This, this clown I'm married to, I need to find a non-clown. But this is the deal. You're a clown that you're married to another clown. You're going to find more clowns. It's a terrible example, and I don't know where I'm going with this. But the point is, is that you're a sinner, right? I'm a sinner, Karen's a sinner, and you know what? If we ever separate and I marry, I'm marrying another sinner, So magnify the institution of marriage. Make your vows mean something. I, Mark, take Keith, thee, Karen, to be my wedded wife, to have and hold from this day forward. For better, for, for richer, for... <laughs> I, love, I did one the other day, man, they did. For richer, for poor, and, and, and she's saying it, and the husband's over there winking. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> I think they were just joking, but I was hoping they were joking. For richer, for poor, in sickness and in hell, to love and... Sure. Till how long? Yeah. Death do us part. Make, magnify the institution of marriage and be intoxicatingly in love with your spouse and make your spouse your most intimate friend. All right. Let's do three points in three minutes. You ready? Here we go. Four, how can I stay sexually pure in a promiscuous world? Take precautions. Let's go back to chapter 5, verse 8 I already read. Remove your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. I just read a book recently called Atomic Habits. You probably have heard of it. It's not a Christian book, secular book. And, uh, I, you know, you can read a secular book and learn biblical principles. So, I want to just, I want to share um, a, a, a paragraph from that book. This is what he says. When scientists analyze people who appear to have tremendous self-control, it turns out that those individuals aren't all that different from those who are struggling. Instead, disciplined people are better at structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower and self-control. In other words, they spend less time in tempting situations. You know what that's called? A biblical principle. All right? So the point is, is that the people, you are not likely to fall off a cliff if you are not walking near the edge. So if you have a massive problem with alcohol, I would strongly recommend you stay out of bars. And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying that it's just, we just, we put ourselves in these situations where, man, you got to have e incredible, enormous willpower to say no.
Um, just take some precautions. And that's what he's encouraging us to do. So don't put yourself in situations. When I was, when I was growing up, my parents, they made some rules that I thought were goofy. Like, my wife and I could not go on a date by ourselves until we were in college. I was like, come on. Meaning we couldn't get in a car and drive somewhere until we were in college. Ridiculous. Thank you, Jesus, they had that rule. And, and what they're doing is, is they're trying to put us, to keep us from situations where we lose it. Take precautions. Set up barriers, you know. This is why when they say you start a diet or something, you know, get the ho-hos out of the cabinet. That was a horrible example, but you know what I'm saying. Number five, how do I stay pure in a promiscuous world? Uh, five, flee, don't flirt. Flee, don't flirt. Look at chapter 7, verse 21. He says, with her enticing words, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Who's the greatest example of this in the Old Testament? To me, it's Joseph, right? Joseph's in the house of Potiphar. He's... He's doing a good job. He's a good man. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. Joseph doesn't stand there and go, now let's talk about this. He got out of there. What does the Bible say in the New Testament? Argue with youthful lust. Flee youthful lust. Sometimes we like the game, you know? We like to flirt. We like to game. We like to play. Don't do that. Flee, don't flirt. And number six, how, how can I stay pure? Stay in the word. Stay in the word. My son, let, let me read 620 and then we'll go. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp. What does the Bible say about the word of God? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, why do I want to listen to my dad? Why do I want to stay in the word of God? To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of the seductress. Get in the word of God. Get in the word of God and do what it says. You say, man, the word of God is old school. You're exactly right, but it is the best way. Listen to the counsel of wise people. If you are blessed with a, with a parent or a friend who has the courage to tell you the truth, listen to them. It's really, really rare. If you have somebody that knows you well and they come up to you and they say, look, man, I love you and I love your wife and I think you're getting too close to that person. You hug that friend. You hug somebody that would have the courage to do that. And you listen to people who see your blind spots. Get in the word of God, get around wise people, listen to what they say. Man, I want to finish the race, don't you? I want to finish the race, and I want to do it well. And I, and, and I look, God uses all kinds of broken people, okay? And, and we, we have, we're, we're all broken. We've all messed up. We've all dropped the ball. And this is not to condemn, but look, this is just to say, hey, today's a new day. Let's move forward. Let's live lives that are clean and pleasing to God, okay? The past is the past. You know, you could have 500 illicit affairs, and they are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't be depressed, but moving forward, let's live a life that pleases him, okay? Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your word. We love this book. We love the wisdom that comes from Proverbs. Help us to live it, Lord. 
We live in an age where sex is loose, sex is entertainment, it's pleasure, it's, it's not valued. It's just an enjoyable thing of life. And it's just gotten so far from what you intended it to be. Help us, Lord, to follow your word and help us to stay clean in a promiscuous world and help us to be lights in a world that is far from you. Be with those who are here tonight who maybe they have a, a sketchy past, maybe they have a promiscuous past, and they f- maybe even right now they feel condemnation. Pray that they would not feel condemnation, that they would feel loved, that God knows everything about them and he still loves them and he has forgiven them if they will look to him. And help us as we leave here to be strong in you, not because of our own strength, but because of your power and your help. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.